So first of all, I'd like to say I'm terrible at cooking, so I was just, just to be clear on that. And um, no, I want to um, thank the Festival of Ideas for uh, inviting me and uh, Alice Beja from the French Embassy and um, Sarah Mitchell as well, who works uh, very hard and very well for uh, welcoming us here. So um, I have to deal with several topics here about national food identity, regional food identity, food heritage in France, uh, 19th and 20th century, in seven minutes. So, um, yeah, I guess I can do it. Um, first of all, um, I'd like to, to, to raise some question about the very words I'm using here. Um, because you, you, may, um, you may have believed that um, I would talk about French recipes, food, and some very interesting things, but I'm afraid I will talk first about concept, which is more boring, I agree, but uh, I think it's necessary to uh, discuss this kind of, uh, of issue. Um, because when I use this kind of expression, like national food identity, regional food identity, and so on, I mean, everybody, uh, nobody is shocked by uh, seeing these uh, expressions used. The food heritage is very common now to talk about food heritage or food identity. But actually, actually, it's not that obvious. Um, identity is a subject that, as you may know, historians and social scientists in general are working on a lot. Um, many kind of identities um, shape any individual, of course, gender, social, professional. And of course, um, all these layers of identity are also relevant regarding food. I mean, you can question food um, uh, in relation with gender, for instance, uh, with social background, of course. And here I'm dealing with what I would call territorial identities, national and regional. But it's only one kind of identity in a whole um, framework. Secondly, I think uh, we must not confuse the notion of identity and the one of I'm not sure the, that's the right word to use, what I would call appartenance en français, belonging in English, I guess. Um, because identity is when you consider yourself um, belonging to a certain group and that you consider uh, um, it is a part of what makes you who you are. It defines you, or at least it defines you partially. Uh, be, but you can belong to a group and not being aware of it and not, of course, claiming to be a part of it. And sometimes even you can refuse it. I mean, I guess you can, for instance, um, you can be English and not feeling yourself European. I guess it's just my hypothesis. So I guess for, for food, it's, it's the same. I mean, uh, it's uh, when you deal with identity, you also must have this notion of belonging, which is quite different. So very often, I think we deal with food identity, but it's also be uh, considered as food belongings, in a way. I'm not sure I'm clear uh, about it. Um, the, the, the tricky part of it is when, uh, as an historian, you have to work on this kind of topic, it's, um, it's you have to rely on discourses. What I mean is uh, you discourses, I mean cookbooks, for instance, uh, which is a kind of discourse, are, pro are produced by very few people. When you are an anthropologist, for instance, you can still uh, interview people to ask them how they feel about food, about their identity or belonging. Uh, but as an historian, when you work on late, even late or early 20th century, you have to rely on books, on, uh, and most of the books cookbooks or any other kind of text uh, are produced by very few people. So when you have to think about food identity, actually, you rely on very few sources. It's really hard to know how the whole community perceives such or such, or such dishes, uh, such or such product. So keep that in mind because I will have to, uh, in a very short time, to give some general idea, but I have all this reservation beforehand to, um, to make. Uh, I would have the same kind of remark uh, about the notion of heritage. Um, because I like to say that heritage doesn't exist in itself. I mean, heritage is um, when a community, a society, uh, has to give this specific quality, the quality of heritage, um, to an object to turn it 
into an heritage. I mean, there is no, nothing, even the most prestigious building, which is an heritage in itself. That's a community which makes it an heritage. Um, so, what's an heritage? Um, what, uh, it's what we see as a legacy from the past, of course, what we see as a legacy from the past, some goods we claim as ours and deem necessary to preserve. That's what we can consider to be an heritage. Which means that food um, became an heritage when you consider, um, when you start considering a, a dish, for instance, a recipe, a product, as a tradition. A tradition specific to a community, a tradition that must be preserved. That's when some products, some food, some dishes uh, start to be and a food heritage. So they are not an heritage by themselves. That's a very important point because now we consider that, of course, uh, food is an heritage, is a cultural heritage, but it's, it's a whole process. So let me be more specific after this uh, kind of uh, generality. Um, first, uh, considering the, the link between uh, Frenchness and cuisine. Um, I've, actually, many things which has been said this morning are also relevant uh, about, uh, about food and, and cuisine. So it can be said that the feeling of um, superiority of the French cuisine, um, of the French about their cuisine, uh, dates back to the uh, 18th century, I think. We find then some French texts, some French authors, um, asserting that French cuisine is the best, uh, the most respected, the most influential, the best in Europe. And... Um, it's not only uh, another proof of the French arrogance, uh, of course, maybe, in a way, but um, it's, it's also true, I mean. The, no. <laughs> what, what's funny? I mean. <laughs> no, it, it's true. For instance, uh, that was the parallel we, we could make with the, uh, the talk of this morning. We have lots of caricatures showing some effeminate French man uh, not eating like John Bull some beef and uh, meat for man and meat for English man. Um, you have lots of uh, caricatures of this kind. But the thing is, uh, when an arist English aristocrat really want a maître d'hôtel, they try to hire a French maître d'hôtel. So you have two kind of, I mean, there you have some representations of the effeminate French man, but also you have uh, the practice, the effective practice, and uh, the fact that even in England, even what we sometimes call the Second uh, 100 War, uh, you also have lots of French cook and lots of French maître d'hôtel uh, um, hired by uh, the English aristocrats. So the, uh, the fact that uh, the, um, the reputation of the French cuisine was built in the 18th century. I mean, of course, it, um, it, it went on in the 19th century with all the prestigious uh, French uh, chefs like uh, Antonin Carême and later on um, uh, Escoffier at the end of the uh, 19th century, early 20th century, who uh, were everywhere in Europe. Carême worked in England, for instance. Um, so the reputation of the French uh, cuisine it was also um, the reflection of, uh, uh, of, uh, of the reality of the situation, if I can say so. Um, so, there was this feeling of superiority. So, when the, um, the national feeling, because it's really hard to know when French, the French population, started to feel themselves, to consider themselves as Frenchmen. There's a whole book about, about it by Jean Weber, and uh, when uh, peasants turn into Frenchmen. Uh, so that's a lot of debates about it. When did the French start to feel French, in a way? And of course, you can have this kind of discussion in many countries. Um, so, but the thing is, you have this feeling of superiority of the French cuisine already there, and during the 19th and 20th century, it just became something obvious for most of the people in France that the French cuisine was, in fact, the best in the world. So it's really just for a few decades that this feeling has been, has been challenged, I guess. As for regional cuisine, the process is, is quite different. Um, actually, before, before the very beginning of the uh, 19th century, there was no such thing as regional cookbook. 
Um, the first regional cookbooks were locally published during the 19th century. I give you some examples there. Um, so then that's how um, that's whole production, not, actually not everywhere in France, of course. They are still uh, quite rare, and many regions don't have their own cookbook, their own uh, reference, I would say. Then at the beginning of the 20th century, um, there were some uh, books um, about regional cookings published in Paris, which was a new thing. And very, at the, um, in the 1901, I guess, we can consider the one by Maurice Chardin is the first one. Um, so, does it mean that uh, regional cuisines, uh, regional cuisines uh, did not exist before? Um, again, it's, it's a complex issue. Uh, what can be said? is that the culinary image of uh, regions, of French regions, has been elaborated from the 19th century onward via cookbooks and various kind of texts. Um, French, French regions uh, have been progressively associated with some dishes and preparations, gastronomic reputation which have endured until today. So that's a slow process which really started in the 19th century. Uh, for example, you see, the cassoulet was presented by some writers at the, um, at, as a long duck, I would say a flag, as a long duck symbol, uh, as early as the um, 1890s. Uh, we can say the same almost even a bit earlier for the bouillabaisse in Provence. So that's the moment, late 19th century, when some specific dishes started, um, where, where became a um, symbol of some local identities. Actually, I think in that case, uh, cooking, cuisine, is, not only a, is, is only a part of a, a, a broader uh, process, um, actually of two processes and um, two phenomena. Uh, first, the regionalist movement. The regionalist movement and the building of modern regional identities from the second part uh, of the 19th century onward. So cuisine is just one aspect of this uh, building, of the building of these uh, regional identities. Then, secondly, uh, a process which is intertwined with the first one, um, the f what I would call the folklorization of material cultures. Uh, at the end of the 19th century, many authors uh, have the conviction uh, that the world, a world, their world, is coming to an end because of the, uh, the, um, the rise of the industrial society of course, and that it's necessary to save um, what can be saved, objects, artifacts, and traditions. So that's, you know, we know the, the work of Hobsbawm about the, uh, the, uh, the, the building of tradition at that time in England and Scotland. So we have almost the same, we have the same process in France at the same time. So we must consider that cooking, cuisine, is just a part in a uh, broader process, which leads me, uh, which leads me to my uh, last uh, point. Uh, when food um, has started to be considered as an heritage, as I defined it uh, in my introduction. Precisely, I think, at the end of the 19th century. Um, the first step in that, in that direction was when culinary knowledge had been considered as one of the popular known how to be saved and part of local identity. So at that very moment, we still don't uh, talk about food as an heritage. Uh, in, French, in French, you say patrimoine. The, the word patrimoine is not uh, applied to food before the late 20th century. But actually, the very beginning of the process, I think, uh, was in late 19th century. And when, at the end of the 20th century, the word patrimoine became so common um, for everything. I mean, now everything is heritage. Everything is patrimoine, I mean, uh, which was uh, unthinkable in the 19th century, of course. It's, I mean, we could speak hour about it. Um, so, again, food is just one part of a very broader process. These heritageization, so it's generalized heritageization. I know I, I was uh, stuttered when I have to pronounce this word, heritageization. And um, food is just one part of this general process. Um, so my point is, first, I'm, 
uh, only here, um, I, I'm only here um, talking about France. I mean, I don't pretend that the patterns I've isolated here uh, are valid um, elsewhere. Actually, I think they are, but not with the same chronology. I think you can see some, the same kind of processes uh, everywhere, uh, but of course with different timing. Um, secondly, my fundamental point here is what we take for evidences, uh, like all the words I used in my presentation, that food is an heritage, for instance. Uh, in fact, these uh, concepts are historical constructions and, of course, uh, cultural representations. Thank you. <laughs>